Hey everyone, there's something refreshing about trying out Famicom games that I never got a chance to play previously. I especially love learning about all of the hidden gems that we never got in the US, as it gives me a repertoire of new games to check out and new experiences to share with all of you. <laughs> this title here is a very interesting one to talk about historically. Simply called Armadillo, it was often compared to both Sonic the Hedgehog and Super Mario Brothers, so much so with the latter that bootleggers went as far as to alter the sprites of this game into Mario characters and then resell it as Super Mario Brothers 4. Surely a game with those kinds of comparisons is worth checking out, right? Well, that's what we're about to find out. Strap in, and let's just see how well Armadillo for the Famicom holds up today. Armadillo was released for the Famicom in Japan back in 1991, published by IGS and developed by AIM. It stars an armadillo with a cowboy hat, because why not, named Billy the Shell, who ventures out to find his love Cheryl. She's been kidnapped by Fat Madillo. That's... that's his name. Fat Madillo. Wow. This guy could lose weight and his entire existence would become a lie. Billy has to travel to different parts of the world in order to defeat the bosses in each area and track Cheryl down. In order to do so, he has to get through eight different worlds with multiple stages that vary in themes and environment. The overworld maps are some of the many reasons this game would be compared to Super Mario Bros., as the style here is at least similar to the one in Super Mario Bros. 3. But honestly, I didn't find the gameplay to be so similar at all. Other than your basic left and right movement with the D-pad, Billy can curl up into a ball with the B button in order to bounce and reach new heights when you hold the button down, as well as use this form to attack the game's various enemies and bosses. Sounds more like a certain pesky hedgehog now, doesn't it? Well, I guess it's not impossible that it took a page from Sonic, as this game came out less than two months after the original Sonic the Hedgehog for the Mega Drive and Sega Genesis. That left a little bit of breathing room if the team had learned about Sonic's development earlier on, but like I said, it's all just speculation anyway. You can even slide down walls or jump up the Mega Man X style, but it's pretty difficult to pull off unless the walls are directly next to each other. Although turning into your ball form is essential for completing each stage, and even makes you invincible, you'd be wise not to use it all the time. Why? Because the controls for it are slippery as all heck. Getting used to moving Billy around in this thing was a huge learning curve that took me more than a few tries to really get the hang of. Learning when to stick with your regular form and when to curl up into ball form was one of the game's biggest challenges. It was particularly hard to balance when you had to deal with curved platforms that would knock and roll Billy in all kinds of directions. There's also the occasional swimming, which is pretty straightforward, although Billy naturally begins to float to the top automatically, making the controls a little harder than simply following a straight line. That said, it is all manageable though, and once you finally get past that initial learning curve, you'll likely find the game to be much more enjoyable. There are various items scattered throughout each stage, some are in plain view while others are hidden inside of the breakable blocks. Some examples include the soda bottle, which grants you temporary invincibility, a shoe that temporarily increases your speed, hey, there's another Sonic similarity, extra lives, and a potion that turns you green and actually makes you vulnerable while in ball form, yet making you invincible in your regular form, essentially switching out the two. There's also dice with random numbers on them which you can collect up to five of per stage. These help increase your score at the end of a stage depending on what combinations you get. On top of that, you can also find secret animal transformations. These each give Billy different abilities that you can access by hitting the transformation button one additional time. You can only carry one at a time though, so it's best to keep in mind which ones you find to be the most useful. These forms include the kangaroo, which allow you to jump higher without having to turn into a ball, the fish, giving you a much faster and smoother swimming ability without you having to worry about Billy floating automatically to the top anymore, the bird, which allows you to reach new heights and glide over most of the stage, and my personal favorite, the snail, which allows you to climb any walls in the game, albeit a little slowly, but hey, this is a snail we're talking about here. There's also an umbrella, which will switch out whatever animal form you had equipped. Pressing up while falling makes you descend slower than normal, allowing you to plan your landings more efficiently. The worlds themselves are quite colorful and varied, ranging from desert landscapes to caves to even New York City itself. There's also casinos. Wait, is that another Sonic comparison? Jeez! The enemy types also change throughout each world, in order to keep you on your toes while learning how to approach each new foe. 
I think the bull enemies gave me the most trouble, as it was hard to see them coming without having known beforehand. There are also various sushi restaurants and bars that you can enter for tips and information from the goat at the counter. Most of them were pretty obvious to me, but a few still managed to tell me things I didn't already know. There's also birds carrying an apple in some stages, where grabbing it will shrink you. At first I assumed that this was a bad thing, but then I quickly realized that shrinking would allow me to reach pathways I couldn't before. It also made wall jumping far easier to pull off. These sections also did a great job of changing things up. The level structure is the part I found to be the most interesting, however. The focus of each world is actually to chase after a boss character on the overworld map and defeat them. The boss character can move one space on the board each time that you do, but it's possible to catch them without having to play through every stage in the world. If you do so and defeat them, you can actually go right to the next one without having to complete any remaining stages you had on that board. It changes up the game's approach pretty significantly and gives you a bit more freedom than expected. Speaking of freedom, there are also aliens hidden in certain stages. If you manage to reach one, it will allow you to use its UFO to take you to whatever level on the map you desire and consequently put you closer to the boss character you're chasing. The boss fights themselves consist of battles with different animals, usually possessing some type of firearm that shoots in various directions. Three hits to each boss takes them out. The only exceptions to this setup were the mech version of Fat Medillo at the game's halfway point, and Fat Medillo himself at the end, who took way more hits to bring down. The game does have its fair share of issues though, and they're important to talk about, as I could easily see some of these design choices holding people back from trying it out. So we already talked about the learning curve, and how it does take some practice to really get the hang of moving Billy around, especially in ball form. What we didn't talk about was repetition. While each unique level in and of itself was great, I found a surprising number of stages that were actual repeats of previous stages. Same platforms, enemies and all. My initial goal when playing this was to ignore the possibility of skipping ahead and simply play through each level anyway just to see what each would have to offer. Finding out that some of these stages were simply repeats of others left me far less motivated to do it and all the more tempted to just skip ahead and reach the finale faster. It's a shame because as I said, I did like the level designs themselves. The other thing we need to talk about is the difficulty spike in the final stages. Who boy does this get ridiculous fast. It's like going from Super Mario Brothers all the way to Super Mario Brothers The Lost Levels in the same game. So basically the arcade version of Super Mario Brothers. Anyway. Not only do platforms become much harder to reach thanks to hazards like this annoying bumper here, but enemies start appearing in places that are very hard to see, and are even harder to do anything about in time if you didn't already know that they were coming. You could compare this level of the game's difficulty to something like, say, the classic Mega Man games, and I'd be right there with you. Trial and error were the only way to get through some of these, and I just had to grin and bear it. Once you finally reach Fat Medillo, you see that this fight is a little longer than the previous boss fights as he doesn't go down after three hits like the rest. The fight itself was not very difficult, however, as all you had to do was dodge his one bounce attack, let him fall into one of his own funnels, and bounce on him, rinse and repeat. Once that's completed, Fat Medillo begins crying and apologizing profusely, saying that he only kidnapped Cheryl because he wanted a girlfriend of his own. Yeesh. Once that's all said and done, Billy and Cheryl are reunited once again, and the credits begin to roll. Overall, I found the whole thing to be pretty colorful and charming. The music, level design, and game structure were all very well done, despite the issues I mentioned before. This was no slouch of a platformer, and certainly didn't deserve to fall into obscurity like it did. So, this one may be a bit of a hard sell for people, and I could understand why. The game has a pretty steep learning curve, an even more ridiculous difficulty spike in the final world, and the repetition and repeats of stages on more than one occasion also brought down my excitement for this a bit. Despite all of that, I still recommend it for old school platforming fans. While I may not necessarily put it up there with the likes of Mario and Sonic, which let's face it are in categories of their own, I still believe that fans of either of those games would find this to be worth a visit. And it's a real shame that this title never came out in the US, as I'm certain that it would have had a larger following if so. And that's going to do it for this video. Let me know your thoughts on this game in the comments below, and I will see you all again soon.